All right, welcome to the FS Podcast. We're here in Poland. I'm with uh, Henrik Fries, and he's currently doing some humanitarian work. And um, it's been great. We've known each other just through our connections in Iraq. But it's finally uh, great to be with you the last week or so and seeing some of the great things that you're doing. Thanks, Dylan. It's a great pleasure to, to be with you and to, to work with you. And uh, can you can you tell me a little bit... Um, about your background and um, go into detail with that and what brought you to uh, Poland and what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah, so I started out af- when I was in university in London. I created a, a news platform that was focused on international affairs, foreign policy, U.S. politics. Uh, and during this time as well, we saw ISIS uh, going into Iraq and into Syria. And, uh, you know, like most people back then, we just saw on social media some of the gruesome videos that were going on. I saw, I remember in particular this one this one video where I saw three uh, Syrian civilians that were just truck drivers. They were taken out of their truck and they were executed by these uh, crazy ISIS uh, terrorists. So, you know, that, that video really uh, got to me and uh, you know, it's it it's I guess it just motivated me to to try and see if there was anything we could do. So, I got five people from my from my university. We went to Iraq. We did three trips, and we we documented the the conflict against ISIS. We we were embedded with Kurdish forces at at one point. We were in Sinjar, Mahmoud, Dohuk, Bashika, different areas, and uh, and we tried to to document the the war from the eyes of of the the Peshmerga and the the Kurdish forces there. And um, and since since then you were in the Danish military and you've been focusing on school and just give me a little bit after <laughs> you've been doing like a lot of things. Yeah. No. So yeah, it, this I was doing while I was uh, a student, but uh, we managed to get, to get it all done. We we made a small documentary, uh, and then uh, I I saw how the the film festival industry worked, uh, and that's when I uh, started thinking that I think there's a huge gap. Uh, for up-and-coming filmmakers, for indie filmmakers. Uh, so we, we, I created a company in London, and then it, it since was in, in Denmark, and, and now it's in, in Estonia, Greece, and, and Indonesia. And it's a, it's a film production company. We do film festivals and, and, and focus in particular on, on, on up-and-coming filmmakers who don't have these huge uh, budgets to, to produce. Um, but yeah, I, I was in the, the, the Danish army as well. Briefly, just under a year, I'm I'm still in the in the National Guard reserves right now, and uh, now I'm living in Madrid, doing an MBA, and uh, at the same time running my company, and and we try to get involved in in humanitarian work uh, where we can, when we can, and uh, and that's what we're trying to do now. So take me through, um, I, when the invasion happened, we were we were kind of communicating already. Yeah. And. Um, I just missed it. I was heading. I was going to head, try to head here before, and even yeah. had a ticket. And when the invasion started, obviously I had to cancel and rethink um, the best way of of approaching you, the Ukraine crisis because how da- you're seeing it, how extremely dangerous it, you know every day it's getting. Yeah. So, um, and you wanted to do really focus on humanitarian stuff. So it was crazy. Is just the context that you already made flying in and all you, you know, you were just researching and trying to find, walk me through kind of like your process and then what ultimately made you decide to get on a plane and come to Poland and, and, uh, gather resources and, and, yeah. and funds. Well, the, the process starts with, first of all, I'm, I'm very interested in, in Paul in, not in politics in general, but in foreign policy and, and mm-hmm. international affairs, as I mentioned earlier. So, so I'm, I'm following what's going on all the time, every single day. Maybe too much I, I'm following it, but it's I'm very invested in it. Uh, so so when, when this happens, um, and let me, let me track back a bit. The reason why I'm invested is having been to Iraq, having seen what people go through, having worked with the military there, having been to dozens of refugee camps, having seen mass graves, having seen dead bodies, having seen people pleading for help for the international community to help you it really makes an impact on you and uh, it really makes an impact on me so 
you cannot just turn a blind eye to 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 suffering. It's it's not correct. It's not morally correct. In the, here in the West, we are wealthy countries. We're well off. Our countries have a lot of money, have a lot of resources, have a lot of military capability, you know, and it's just not moral to to stand by and watch what's going on in Ukraine right now and not do anything about it. It's not it's not correct. Yeah. Can you give me a little bit um, of the situation that you've been seeing in Poland in yeah. response of really the humanitarian aid and what you're hearing and um, uh, where our location is right now and yeah, how, yeah. How, how close it is? Yeah, so we're in, in Lublin in Poland right now on the on the eastern side of the country. We are about an, an hour and a half from from the border. Um, I just about two weeks ago, uh, I started contacting some military supply stores uh, in and around Poland in Warsaw and Krakow in, in Lublin and uh, got into contact with the, a guy who runs the, the 511 military supply stores here. And uh, and he said, come, we need help and uh, we need help with logistical support and stuff like that. And I have a bit of experience in that with for my days in Iraq and for my company and stuff like that. So we came and uh, yeah, we've been here for, for a few days now. And um, can you tell me a little bit about why you're focusing on military equipment, mm -hmm. bags, clothing? Um, one of the reasons why um, why that's important. Yeah, I, I think first and foremost that donating to any charity is great. And, and, and certainly uh, people from every kind of uh, area need help. Refugees need help. People need food, people need water, people need clothing. But when you try to look at a problem, I think you need to look at the root problem. Uh, and the root problem is not refugees. I think this is a temporary problem that, of course, needs to be addressed. And a lot of people are addressing that. And a lot of great companies are, are working on dealing with that. But to solve the problem permanently, you need to solve the, the root, which is Putin, which is Russia right now. Uh, so we need to support the Ukrainian army. We need to support them with military supplies. We need to urge our representatives, our elected officials, to give weapons to them. We need to urge our, our governments to implement a no-fly zone. We need to urge NATO to do that. We need to be more involved because what's happening now is very similar to what happened in World War II. And we waited too long to get involved. Uh, 50 million people died in that conflict. And, and we cannot let that repeat. And, and the risks are much are significantly higher now that we have nuclear weapons and stuff uh, involved as well. But if I could just say one, one more thing. We are much stronger than Russia. It's, it's not going to be, in my opinion, a difficult fight. And in my opinion, I don't believe that nuclear weapons are going to be used. I believe this is a bluff coming from Putin who wants to move them to, to Belarus. It's not in his interest to use it because the West has nuclear weapons. It's not in anybody's interest to use it. But we have significantly stronger air power. We have a significantly stronger military. We have a much more solid economy. The, the, the Russian economy is crumbling right now. They cannot sustain what they're doing in Ukraine. It cannot be sustained. But we need to stop being weak. We need to act with courage. Uh, and we need to, to do what needs to be done to support President Zelensky in Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Um. So uh, you mentioned people need to help. Um, so not every person is able to get on a plane, go to Poland. Of course. And be able to network, you know, uh, with that kind of experience. But where are some, you mentioned, obviously donations to the right type of organizations or individuals, because you see a lot, not mm -hmm. just big nonprofits, but really great individuals who are doing awesome things with really good connections and can sometimes bypass different um bureaucratic type right. of things um which are needed and sometimes it gets in the way or makes things slower uh so where are things some uh you mentioned donations and helping but also you said contact your elected officials um even for me i don't even know what that means other mm -hmm. than calling or emailing them mm -hmm. yeah I mean? but so, call, call their off call your call the office of your elected officials call their secretaries send them letters post to them post to their facebook page be relentless in that. But there's many ways you can help. And I would say the first and most important thing is to get informed. Get informed. 
want to get informed, learn about the situation. And, you know, for a lot of people, this is very foreign. Oh, this is, this is far away. This is in, in the eastern part of, of Europe. And, and it's every crisis, every conflict, it's the same way. You know, oh, this is in Iraq. This is so far from where I live. I, how does this affect me? That's how people think. But we need to be better at putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Because once we do that, if we, if we think, what if that was me? What if I was in, in that situation? What would I want? Oh, you would want help, for sure. Oh, you would want the military to protect you and your country, for sure. You would want humanitarian supplies, for sure. You would want military supplies to go to the troops, to your troops, for sure, right? So, so the, it's crucial to, to be informed. It's just crucial to be informed and to have the empathy to understand what people are going through. Um, if you have contacts, if you have contacts with people or supply stores anywhere around Europe or, or the world that can help provide some sort of equipment, if it's useful equipment, any type of military equipment, if you have connections to, to sleeping bags, tents, batteries, anything, it's useful. The military in Ukraine, they need everything right now. Yeah, I, um, what I've noticed, which I, I didn't think this was the case because maybe because um, the US, you don't really see this, but a lot of people here in Poland and Europe really do think that Russia is going to try to take over not just Ukraine, but there's a really big worry and scare, which I, I just assumed I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's a few individuals, but more and more people I come across, I'm, yeah, it, they really are there scared. Is. Yeah, no, there is for sure. I think, uh, and they have every reason to be scared. I mean, and it, and it's, it's impossible to predict what Putin is thinking. What is he going to do next? We didn't know what, what Hitler was thinking, what he was going to do next. But the, the lessons that we need to learn, and we haven't learned it, but we need to learn, is that you cannot have this appeasement policy where you just sit back and let these evil dictators do what they want. Because he invaded Georgia in 2008, and we didn't do anything. He invaded Crimea in 2014, and we didn't do anything. So this gives Putin the free realm to think, okay, they're not acting. I'm not getting any, any backlash from this. I'm going to continue. And that's exactly why we're in the situation that we're in today. Yeah, it's just if... And, and the people who suffer are Ukrainian people. They're, yeah. they're, it's almost like they're in the middle of between um, power countries, you know, and they're the ones that are suffering the most and it's unfortunate and um you know you would see uh just at the border we were at the border last night mm -hmm. and you just see people waiting for buses waiting for family members and and this is just the beginning yeah like i've seen reports that you know close to a million have already fled ukraine there's been expectations of that increasing to some reports between four to six million yeah it's a very large country i mean i'm assuming a lot of the people even in the donbass area that far area that's going to be very difficult for them because it's very far away to any other um european border um so what what kind of what some of the things that you've noticed either at the border or just some some people who are working uh, yeah. to help this crisis well, it's right now. It's very chaotic, and uh, and yesterday, uh, as you know, we we tried to, or not tried, we did. There, we managed to coordinate an evacuation from Kiev and get three people and a dog, from the border to to Lublin, and uh, you know, you can see the the fear in 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 people's eyes, and, and I think an even a sadder story, which was a few days ago, we had a a family who, who were in Lviv and uh, it was uh, the son who is around my age, I guess, 25, 28, who has a wife, uh, who has a daughter, a young girl, who has a mother and who has a grandmother as well, 91 years old, the grandmother. And uh, and they were going to, to escape and we were supposed to pick them up. At the end, we didn't because, because of chaos and... Uh, and people are also scared to 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 drive with with people they don't know because there's the situation at the border is that there can be trafficking and it's it's really messy situation. But the sad thing was that when we were talking to to the soldier, you know, he wasn't going to come with them. He, he's not allowed. 
every man aged 18 to 60 has to stay behind in Ukraine. So they were all together that night spending, you know, the last night together for probably a very long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's it's heartbreaking. It's really uh, ho horrible to 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 think about. Uh, and, and it's like I said before, it's, it's about we, we need to be better to put ourselves in his shoes, in the shoes of his wife, of his girl, of his grandmother. What are they going through right now? You know, it, it's, it's horrible. Imagine you're, you, you have your, all your whole family and you're spending the last night with them. Everyone is scared. You just lost your home. There's a war in, in, all of, in the entire country. You're saying your goodbyes to them for the last time, possibly ever. It's not, uh, you know, and the rest of Europe, we're just sitting by. No, it's not. It's not right. Um, as far as you, you, you've studied foreign policy, been involved with it. Um, what to some, how does like with the European nations and everything where they're doing sanctions and they're, you know, telling Russia, if you don't do this, we're going to do this. Does that play effect immediately to something like Russia or is it just... Is it just all kind of, it's a, it's a, almost like a game, but, you know, but they seem like it's very serious. Like they've been very quick. They so have. So can you maybe talk about kind of the foreign policy yeah. experience of when, when something like this Absolutely, happens? Absolutely, yeah. The, the sanctions that the, the EU countries, NATO countries, and, and also the U.S. have been leading is very good. And it's, and we have to uh, give credit where credit's due. And we, we need more of it. Uh, there's still more that can be done. Not all of the Russian banks have been blocked by SWIFT. All of them need to be blocked. We need to stop buying Russian oil and gas. That hasn't happened yet. We need to stop that. And uh, I think now is not the time to think about uh, climate uh, re renewals and, uh, and sustainable energy. We, we, we need to, we're in war right now, right? We can think about that right after this conflict. I think the U.S., they need to reopen the Keystone pipeline to produce more oil so we don't have to be dependent on Russia. Because if we're buying oil from Russia, we're financing this war. So there, there's more steps that need to be taken. Yeah, I've, I saw that actually U.S. does have a lot of oil from Russia. Yeah. More than I, I realize. Much more. And not just not just the, the U.S., the, all of Europe. All of Europe buys oil. We buy all of our oil from, from Russia. So we need, to, we need to stop that. And if we stop that, we completely hammer their their economy and they won't be able to to finance their their operations we're, we're already seeing how unorganized the russian military is the russian soldiers they don't want to fight this war they don't want to fight their neighbors they don't understand why they're there this is the actions of a unstable 69 year old leader who's thinking about his legacy and wanting to to rebuild the soviet empire this is what this war is about and with that, obviously, it's going to be higher gas prices and everything like of that. Of course. But, like, like well, but, a lot of people here... But we need here, to be willing to accept that. Yes, exactly. We need to be willing to accept that. You know, we, we cannot expect to live the same lives as we do when, when we have this crisis going on. We ha There are going to be repercussions, and we all have to accept that, and we all have to work together for a common goal, for a common good, to eliminate the threat, and then we, and then we will be living in a better world. And then we can think about uh, more sustainable solutions and, 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 and so forth. Yeah, I think a lot of people in, in the U.S. and the West kind of see this crisis as um, just a, like a Russia and Ukraine thing only. Yeah. But it really is like it's much, so much bigger than that. It's, it's, um, it's not just like a, between two countries that have been going at it all the time. Um, it's, it really is like a conflict. It's a war that connects us all. It connects the U S it connects mm -hmm. for sure Europe. And, um, it's very important for people to keep, to understand it. And you are seeing a huge united, like the whole globe is united. Absolutely. And, and that's really been wonderful to see. And it's been, you know, I think President Zelensky of Ukraine has, has really been able to to mobilize international support. Uh, and and what a tremendous figure this guy is. I mean, what he's been doing, you know, staying in his country, being courageous, being brave, leading the country, 
mobilizing support, talking to leaders every single day. I mean, this guy, he, he is really, I think, something special. Yeah, you're, I, I can't believe just because you hear stories about Kiev and it's just every day seems like it's, it's getting more and more scary. Yeah. And um, the situation, I guess, we can give an update of, of what's currently happening in Ukraine based off people talking over there uh, that we're talking to in Ukraine mm -hmm. and what we're seeing on the news following different independent media. And um, it looks like Russia's trying to cut the country in half from Crimea to Kiev. Um, that's what they really want, Kiev, it seems like. It yes. seems like they really want it. And it seems like Russia's trying to decide to either just bomb the whole place because it that city is going to be so difficult for Russia to take over if they're just going to use manpower and tanks. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think we're going to see something that we've been seeing in, in Kharkiv and in Sumy, where they have been shelling and and sending airstrikes indiscriminately, targeting schools, hospitals, I mean, residential buildings, whatever. They, they don't care. They don't care. But, but it... it you know, they can send as many bombs as they want. I, they're not going to break the resolve of the Ukrainian people. They are, they're not going to, they're not breaking. And, you know, we, we talk, you mentioned that I think we have 600 or so thousand people that have crossed just the Polish border and more than a million in total. But more than 70,000 people have crossed the other way to go to Ukraine. Soldiers that want to fight and defend their countries, Ukrainians coming from abroad, living abroad, coming back home to Ukraine to fight. This is a huge uh, morale boost and, and says everything that you need to know about the Ukrainian people. Yeah, we saw like four of them about to get on a on a yeah. bus and head towards Ukraine. And that's why they need a lot of boots, cold weather gear, um, because I'm sure even the Ukrainian uh, government were shocked how many volunteers they're getting. Um, yeah, I mean, they need supplies. I mean, we saw this one guy who who lived in Norway. This guy was, I'm guessing, around 60 years old. You know, he, he wasn't a, a typical army looking guy. Uh, and but he, he came, he came to to go to Ukraine to to defend this country. And although I have so much respect for that. I think we can do. I think NATO needs to, to do better. It's not just Ukrainians going to fight. Yeah. I'm hearing about Danish people going to fight in Ukraine. I'm hearing about Norwegian people going to fight in Ukraine. We, we, we shouldn't be sending ordinary civilian people to fight. Why do we have our own? Why do we train? Why do we have a, a military? Why do we spend billions and billions of dollars uh, on this? It, it's so easy for us to implement the no-fly zone, right? That doesn't involve sending ground troops. A no-fly zone means that you can, you close the airspace. And I think it's the most effective military measure that, that, that we could take right now because it would completely devastate the Russian Air Force and give a huge boost to an ability for the Ukrainian forces to, to defend themselves. I think this is the very least that uh, that we can do. Yeah, it especially... it in um, urban warfare and everything, if you don't have the air to help out, it makes it way more difficult. And how does that work with no fly zone? You just have to number of countries vote on vote on that policy or? No, I, any any country with a courageous leader could take the, the decision to do it. Of course, it must be said that there are there are risks associated with it. If you do it, you are you are actively going to be shooting down Russian jets, and that puts you in direct confrontation with Russia. But if Russia responds to a NATO country, then you activate Article 5, and then all NATO countries have to be involved. So people say, okay, but if you do a NATO, a, a no-fly zone, you're starting World War III. No. Putin has already started World War III. It's about us supplying and taking care of our ally. We cannot let anyone bomb indiscriminately residential buildings in an entire country that consists of 44 million people. That's insane. Yeah, it's like Texas. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, it's it's 
it really is like even talking to some of the Polish people here who are helping, um, helping because helping Ukrainian people mm-hmm. because we even met one guy who some of his best friends are Ukrainian mm-hmm. and used to go down and hang out, go down and visit them and hang out and vice versa and drink vodka and yeah. have a good time. Yeah. Um, and even talking with him, he's like mentally preparing about what's going to happen with Poland. Yeah. So it's, um, that's the one thing I didn't realize was coming here. I was like, wow, people are really here. Like are really scared. Yeah. Uh, not for sure. Yeah. But, and, and a lot of people are helping and, and it's, it's, I think it's been wonderful to see. It's been wonderful to work with these Polish and Ukrainian people here because, you know, they are, they work ruthlessly. This one guy who we've been, who we've been with the entire time, he's not had two minutes where he hasn't been on the phone. He's on the phone constantly trying to get more supplies, trying to deliver the supplies to make sure they reach the Ukrainian forces, trying to to help refugees get out of the country, uh, trying to coordinate evacuation routes. I mean, there's so much work that needs to be done. And this is some of the work that we're trying to do here as well, uh, besides supplying uh, or providing military supplies. Uh, I think it's uh, incredibly important that uh, that we do this, and I think more people can help, and, and help is needed everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of like safety equipment, vests, um, armor, helmets, boots, cold weather gear, um, thermal optics. Yeah. Um, there, it seems like there's a big need for it. And, and this is one more thing that uh, countries need to to change the bureaucratic process of how this works. Because we're, we're having a, we're trying to get a lot of Kevlar vests uh, to Poland and from Poland to Ukraine. But countries are being very difficult with exporting and with shipping vests from one country to another. Yeah. And, and and this needs to stop. It's yeah, like bureaucracy. in the U.S., yeah. to a lot of the plate carriers, which I have a set, yeah. they've said, no, we can't ship internationally. Even though I can get on a plane, check in my yeah, bag yeah, exactly. yeah. with, with all my helmet and safety gear, no yeah. problem. Yeah, no, I think this is the, this is an easy measure that we can do just to make sure we can get Safety the right gear. supplies. It's yeah. protecting yourself. It, yeah. you're, it's not even, it's not weapons. It's not lethal weapons, no. It's not lethal weapons. We, we will let the governments take care of the lethal weapons, and, and they are. And a lot of countries are have been committed to, to send a lot of weapons and, uh, and military funds, and that's wonderful. But from what I'm hearing on the ground, it's too slow. It's not arriving on time. And um, I even saw reports that, like, some of the weapons that they got were very out, kind yeah. of outdated and maybe yeah. not properly stored correctly or something like that. Yeah, we, we heard that about the, the German supply that they got. Uh, I read today that the equipment was completely out of date that they got from, from Germany. So it's also about sending the correct and the right supplies. You don't, you don't, you don't want to waste your time getting a huge batch of, uh, of weapons that you can't use. It's a waste of time. So how can um, you're going to continue this work? Uh, what's the best way for to people to keep up to date what you're doing and how they can donate and um, uh, what are some of the ways that people can do that? They can follow HF Productions on, on social media, on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we might be creating a, a very small scale NGO uh, so we can continue focusing on, on this level of uh, military support and humanitarian aid. And... Uh, and they can donate. Uh, we have a PayPal link that they can donate that's in the HF Productions uh, Instagram bio and Facebook bio and stuff like that. And they can also reach out to us. If you have uh, large funds that you want to send over, reach out to us. We have supply stores in, in Poland where all kinds of shipments can reach. Uh, all of the material we get gets delivered directly to the airborne divisions in Ukraine, to different kinds of military units. We have direct contact with them. So. If you have contacts with shipments, with supplies, with funds, any type of support, everything is needed, especially on a military level. That's what we want to want to focus on. Yeah, and I'll include all those links in uh, in my bio and stuff like that to make sure people can find it. And if they want to support, they'll support you. And what's great is just see is just you decided to do your research and you had the will and wanted to come and make a difference. And um, that's pretty great to see. That's uh, I think, I think a lot of people see this as really, yeah, it is difficult. You have to have the right mentality. You have to have the right mindset and yeah. and mind to to accomplish what you want to do. Um, 
And so what have you, it seems like you are really interested in humanitarian aid work. Mm -hmm. Um, What's been some of your um, things that you try to do when you're in this uh, humanitarian type of work, some of the procedures or how you look at it, a situation like um, just kind of like how running an NGO or, Mm -hmm. you know, running humanitarian aid, seeing the situation, analyzing it. What are some of the ways that you try to approach things? Well, first, you need to have the will to, to do anything. But I, I would just want to add to your point as well previously. A lot of people can help off the ground as well. And we have been so lucky. I've been so lucky to have people in, in England uh, that are, are helping me. I have this w- colleague, Ben Weeb. He's been phenomenal in getting support and getting supplies to us. Uh, I have people in Greece that have been outstanding with support. Uh, you know, this is really helpful. You don't have to necessarily travel uh, to Poland, to Ukraine to help. You can help offline. You can help at, in your, at your home. You can make calls. There are, there's so many ways to help. You can just get in contact with an NGO and ask them, how can I help from my home here? Of course, a lot of people, they cannot go. They have work. They have a family. They have uh, many commitments. So it's perfectly understandable. Uh, for me, uh, I also have a lot of commitments and um, I'm doing another, I'm doing an MBA now. So it's obviously a little bit difficult to, to, to organize, but, um, but I, I, I just, the way I approach it is I, I try to find a, a gap in my schedule. Uh, sometimes I have to miss a few things and I'm, I'm willing to do that. Uh, yeah, it, it's not, it's not much more complex than that for me. Uh, find a gap, be motivated to go. Uh, have a good system, uh, support system that can support you while you're over there. Uh, work with some good, fantastic individuals. Uh, be surrounded with them, and then make the the best out of it, and see how much support you can provide. That's what it's about for me. That's great. So I think, um, I think since this this conflict is still really in the early days, mm-hmm. um, where will you be focusing on the next? You know this. Uh, for I guess this month. Yeah, so I think uh, last day, yesterday, we, we managed to ship 50 military boots to to the airborne division in, uh, I'm not gonna say we're in Ukraine, but in Ukraine. And uh, today we're gonna work on getting another 20, 30 or 40 boots uh, and as well f- as, as 50 sleeping bags. And we're also coordinating with uh, different countries uh, I don't want to mention them specifically because there may be some political issues uh, there but we're, we're trying to get some uh, vests and uh, and more uh, advanced military equipment and, and tactical gear and and uh, infrared scopes and uh, thermal scopes and night vision goggles etc and drones with infrared cameras this is the type of equipment we want to be able to to supply and, and we we have all the the routes and the connections to do it Funding would be very much appreciated. The more funding we have, the more we can order and, and, and deliver. So I'm going to continue to work on this when I, when I go back to, to Madrid and, and probably I'll be coming back when, when I, whenever I have the time to, to come back. But we already now, the, the most important thing for us was to, to start and develop a base of operations in Lublin, which we have now. We have an office that we can work out of. We don't have to be here uh, physically. Uh, we can we can still do all the connections and and make sure that all the equipment arrives where it needs to arrive yeah that's great and um everyone here yeah you're currently you're sending stuff you're sending stuff today you're going to continue once you get funds you you have you could start sending stuff and yeah and and every single cent that we go goes towards this we don't take a salary we're all here as volunteers every single cent every single dollar that we get goes directly to buying more equipment and, and also, we are also paying for more than what we get. My company is helping fund uh, a lot of equipment as well. Uh, for us, it's just about getting as much uh, as possible as we can. That's great. Well, thank you, and we'll do this again. We'll do an update on what you're doing, and I uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. And it's been it's been fun getting to know you. Yeah, and likewise, Dylan, thank you for, for all your support. You've been uh, amazing and great to work with. And, uh, and yeah, I look forward to, to working with you in, in the future as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, man.